Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast, a podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today is a podiatrist all the way from Cardiff in Wales. He's the owner of Podmed Podiatry, and his name is Pritten Co- Chohan Solanke. So, Pritten, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. It's very wet and uh, cold here in uh, Cardiff this morning. So yeah, when you no, say when you say wet and cold, what what's wet and cold? Uh, like I understand the wet. What <laughs> what do you mean by cold? How cold is that? Oh, I think it's been about somewhere around ten degrees or or so for, for yeah. spring, which, which is about normal. But the wet bit it doesn't help. It's yeah, not that's... like in the sunny Queensland there. Yes, well, where I'm in Cairns, it is. Um, what are we now? We're in autumn, which would be the fall if anybody's listening to it in America, and it was. 33 degrees today which yeah. uh, that's yeah, that's celsius for america <laughs> so that that is uh hot <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we've got you on here the subject we're going to talk about today i think this episode is going to kill it i reckon when people see the title they're going to go oh i need to check that out because we're going to talk about there's nothing routine about routine foot care yeah, and routine foot care, it, it, I want to get away from the term routine. Yeah. It makes it sound boring. So you kind of just general foot care or foot care, um, regular foot care, just get rid of the routine because if you, you've, we've all seen that patient where we've, we've they've come in, they've got a problem. It may be something simple as they can't get down to reach their toenails. Yeah. And then you kind of go, you do, you do what you do, and then they I think you're the best thing since sliced bread. And they're like, amazing. You've been brilliant for me. And that's probably had just the same amount of effect for them as for for you nailing a pair of orthotics or something like that. So it is a case of it's it's trying to think, making sure that we're getting what we want out of the profession. But also the patients probably appreciate a lot more of the the, the straightforward core stuff we do um, more than what we really uh, recognize and appreciate ourselves. So what you're saying is we, we've got a, instead of just looking at what we're doing is boring and routine and dull, and we've got to realize the impact we're actually having on the patient and how yeah. that is possibly changing their life. So it could be something as a simple corn and somebody yeah. be going, oh, I've got to do another bloody corn. How boring is this? But they don't realize removing that corn, how happy that patient is afterwards and what they can do. Yeah, exactly. You, it, once you once it, it's literally like if you think about that, like you say, you've got a really simple corn. You take that corn out. That corn may have been stopping that patient from being more active. You're improving their their general health. They're getting out and about a bit more. They're doing more exercise. They're reducing their risk of cardiovascular disease, reducing their risk of developing diabetes just by removing that corn and making sure that that doesn't come back. Yeah, doing all the nice things like orthotics and nail surgery might sort of contribute to that as well. But you kind of let's think about the, what we do on a day to day basis. And, and and most common patient that I would see, I do their nails, I do some bit of hard skin, I do their corns and calluses. But the, they go right, okay, I'm good to go now. Yeah. Um And it's that it's that sort of thing is that if we do our basics right, we'll get less complications and less high risk stuff. Okay, and it's also looking at from the patient's point of view too, is how would you feel if you were going somewhere and your GP was going, ah, another just health check? How boring is this? And you're thinking, well, hang on, hang on. I'm I'm the patient, I'm paying you. I want you to actually care about what you're doing. I'm sorry if I'm boring you and you need to leave because that would be terrible. That would be absolutely awful. And again, you want your, your, your... you want your healthcare, uh, healthcare. Uh, I'm going to say worker professional yeah. uh, to be interested in you and what you, um, what you want to get out of the consultation and how how that will impact me as a patient. Okay, and if I find that okay, I've got some good advice here. I've got, got some good ways to go. I've got some whatever it is, and you go away. You do that. You feel better for it. You're always going to come back to that professional anyway. Yeah. So it may be sort of basic and routine, but you'll be you'll probably get 
more business like, but you'll get more patients from word of mouth referrals that way. And it is a case of thinking about um, doing those little things. Like I, I got, I've started to think about this a bit, a lot more since I started working um, at the Cardiff University with nursing lecturers. And they talk about the fundamentals of care. So and that's your cleaning, your washing of patients, your oral hygiene. And again, if you're doing all of those simple things effectively, yeah. you reduce the out, you reduce the chances of anything catastrophic happening later on. So it's a case of how can we employ that in podiatry and do our fundamentals right to be able to make sure that patients are um, pathology free for longer. Yeah, and it's really only routine if you want it to be routine. So even if you picture an older person coming into the clinic for the, for you to cut their toenails because they can't reach them, why can't they reach them? What what else? What is happening with them that they can't reach them? Is it because they're a high risk patient? Uh, is it mobility issues? Is it eyesight issues? There's all these other things that can be going on. But while that patient is with you, instead of just clipping the toenails and getting them out. What else can you do with that patient while they're there? Checking, yeah, like there's so many other tests that you can do on top of just cutting the toenails to make the make the visit more interesting for you and more beneficial for the patient. Yeah, and and, and that's it. It's like if a patient comes in and says, "Oh, oh no, I, I feel a bit stiff. And I can't get down there." Then you can kind of go into that sort of MSK sort of stuff, give them some simple exercises to do to help mobility or. Um, if you're saying that um, they're having trouble with their breathing, then you can start sort of thinking about um, why are they having trouble with their breathing? I know it's not exactly foot, foot related. Yeah. So in, in South Wales here, we have a high incidence of um, COPD because of a uh, long history of coal mining. Uh, and okay. so a lot of, a lots of patients can't bend over and maintain that pos- position to be able to cut their toenails because it exacerbates their COPD and they just can't get enough air into their lungs. So you ask them, have they been to see uh, uh, their doctor about the breathing and and their postural issues? Are they on the appropriate inhaler? So you're making that consultation, not just about cutting their toenails, you're making their life better. And that's what you've got to think about. It's it's a case of making sure that you're, we have a a scheme in, in South Wales called make every contact count. So, it's not just what else can you add to your consultation to make it a better uh, for a better outcome for that patient. So it might be a case of, do you want to talk about uh, weight loss? Do you want to talk about um, uh, smoking cessation? Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about exercise? How you can do that? But it's about adding that into your consult to be able to make that patient's life better in the long run. Yeah, but again, the patient's got to be ready for it, and then you got you you use that time almost like almost like motivational interviewing technique. So, are you ready to talk about this to start with? And then, if they say yes, then you can kind of go down that rabbit hole. If they're not, then you go okay, maybe we'll we'll have a chat back next time. Yeah, if they tell so you again, sh- shut you- up and just cut my toenails, then yeah, <laughs> then- yeah, just shut- yeah. <laughs> but you're not going to get too many patients that are ever- like majority of patients I ever saw in my clinic. If it was uh, general foot care. A lot of the times, and I just tell this to the people that work with me, I get every patient that sits in, regardless of what you're doing with them, you can either, you can make it boring, I said, or you can make it as interesting as you want. I said, you just hmm. need to look deeper and, and, tr- and treat them as a person, not just as a foot that's sitting in front of you. Yeah, and, and that's it. It's like taking that whole um, holistic and patient-centeredness of what you do and how you can make that that consult interesting for you. So, like you say, is is how how can you how can that patient benefit from seeing you? They might come see you before they will go and see their GP um, because it might be easier for them to come and see you and make an appointment yeah. than it is for them to actually make an appointment with their GP. But then you can sort of say, oh, a, a kind of from there it goes. Okay, well, we've identified these few things, but I think you need to see the doctor. Let me write a letter to the doctor. The doctor sees that and goes, oh, oh, this podiatrist seems to know what he's talking about. Maybe I should send him patients. So it, it's a case of like that's kind of the relationships you need to build as well in kind yeah. of making that routine care benefit for you, if you see what I mean. 
Yeah, and if you can show that you care more at a deeper level with general foot care, with you know referring practitioners, then maybe they're going to be more like they're more likely to send you other types of patients as well. Yeah, especially like, if they know I'm, you you go that extra yard with all the patients when you see them. Yeah, so I I I have like I said I, I have one I I do my clinic one day a week, um, and all of my patients come from GP referrals from the GP practice I work in. Yeah. So I I I don't I I have leaflets in the GP practice and that's it. I don't really advertise anywhere else. But they get I get the patients I like to see and and yeah. like your um. Cade mentioned in, in the last podcast, it's finding your podiatry. And I think that's that's really important. Is like you got to find a thing that excites you, but not not ignore the basics and the core, not the basics, the core work that you would do. See, so, I, I'm trying really hard. Yeah, no, that's right. You said I'm that. Saying, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying really hard to to change my language and after being thinking about this for a while. I know. I know. And it's <laughs> it is one of those things because if you don't see routine foot. I think because in the profession, when we say routine foot care, everyone knows what we're talking about. But what we're talking about here is just because you use the word routine, don't treat it like it's just a routine. Because I'm sure if you were getting heart surgery, I'm sure there's certain things a cardiologist does that's just routine. But mm -hmm. I'd like to know if he's operating on my heart, he's paying a little bit extra attention that day. <laughs> he goes to the extra yeah. yard. He wants to check out a couple of other things. Oh, I wonder what that lump is. Have a look while you're there. May as well check it out. Don't just treat me like another heart operation that's about to get done. Yeah, no, and, and that's it. You, you just want want that extra bit of care given. And and I'm I'm not I, I'm not saying podiatrists don't do this. It's just that sometimes that we all expect we we all assume we're all doing it, but nobody actually sticks their hands up and goes, "This is what I do. What you yeah. what are you doing?" Okay, so with you, you yeah, you said you do this one day a week. What are you doing the other four days? Um, so I'm a, a lecturer in, at Cardiff University, but I'm a lecturer in adult nursing. Okay. How did you so, end up in um, that? I, how, how did you go? So now, now we need to dive a bit into <laughs> the Britain story. So you 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 are a podiatrist, which is why you're on here. Yes. Yep. I'm a and, podiatrist, been podiatrist for twenty odd years. But now you're lecturing in nursing at university. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so um, I've been working in education for a long time. So I qualified in 2001 and um, then worked in, in the NHS for a couple of years. And then a job came up at Cardiff, well, Cardiff Metropolitan University um, as a clinical tutor. Yeah. So I got, I, I applied, I got that job. Fantastic. Really enjoyed it. I had five really good years. And I was starting to think, right, time for a bit of a change. And I moved to Australia. Whereabouts uh, in Australia? On the Central Coast. Okay. Yeah, you, I, I've noticed you've got lots of people from the Central Coast on recently. I know. it's uh, You sort of get runs of people. But the Central Coast is a really nice area, which is why there's so many people move there. Yeah, it, it was lovely. And um, I, I originally, I, in, I, I, I was in, uh, when I first went over, I was working for um, a regional hospital in Robinvale, sort of about an hour from Mildura, so literally the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And then kind of got a job as a lecturer in podiatry at the University of Newcastle on the central coast. Okay. And then I got homesick and I came home back to the UK. And um who the person who had my old job What what was it about was home that you got what what made you homesick? I was on my own. I was there on my own pretty much most of the time for for four years and, yeah. and kind of it was really enjoyable and it was like I play a lot of cricket I joined the cricket team and all that sort of stuff but kind of the grind get, get got you down a little bit and then the the leave wasn't very generous um so I ended up using up a lot of my leave at Christmas which didn't leave didn't leave much time for myself the rest of the year yeah, but I suppose it's one of those things too. Your your I always say your home is where your heart is, and yep. like I'm I'm born and bred Queenslander, so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Brisbane, Gold Coast, Cairns, you know these are the places that I've lived, and I could never see myself moving out of Queensland <laughs> to, to live anywhere else because I like warm weather. Mm, yes, I could see myself yeah. living in Bali or Thailand, <laughs> something like that, because it's the same thing. It's just warm weather. Yeah, no, and um, yeah, so 
and that was it. it. It was more kind of got homesick, just wasn't enjoying it as much as I was. And so, okay, we came back to the UK. And as luck would have it, the person who took over from my job when I left to go to Australia, yeah. they left uh, teaching at the university. So I applied for my old job back. And so did you ever that. think you would be a lecturer? Was that always on the cards when you when you studied podiatry? You went, oh, I want to be a lecturer one day. How did you fall into that role? Um, I kind of, I, I wanted to sort of do sort of, I wanted to do MSK sort of surgical type work. That's where yeah. kind of where I found interest. Um, but it wasn't until I got a, got that initial job at Cardiff Metropolitan University as a as a technical demonstrator is what they term it as, sort of a clinical tutor. Um, and I really enjoyed that sort of exchange with students and kind of working things out, that sort of education side of it. And I kind of went, okay, we'll, we're going, going to go down this route. I got my teaching certificates and qualifications. Yeah. And so it was just a case of, right, okay, I've been in education and let's see if we can run with it a little bit. Um, and that was it really. And kind of, and then I, that's kind of the pool of jobs I was looking at sort of more in the education and rather than in public health or, or private healthcare. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how I felt. And it was, it was more to do with that interaction we have with the students. And the one thing I really found was that, you know, when you explain something to anybody, whether it's a student, a, a podiatrist who's been qualified for years and they go, click, I get yeah. it, got it. And that, that that kind of really got me fired up. That, that that that's what I really enjoyed. Getting having that that person have that opinion to go right. That's it. I get that now. And so trying to work on those skills and trying to explain things and kind of transfer that across. And that that kind of made my day. Um. So <clears throat> so yeah. So I worked worked there and then I was lecturing uh, on at the University of Newcastle for. So three and a half years, four years. Yeah. Um, and then came back, came back to Cardiff, and I I ha had my my old job as a clinical tutor for a little while, and I thought I'd be really clever and try private practice. <laughs> How'd that go? Yeah. Uh, and so I kind of it was kind of I stopped everything and just went into private practice cold turkey, which was the worst thing I did. So yeah. I loved it. <laughs> um and so I tried to set up got some good clients got some got got a little bit of traction but not in, nowhere near enough so I ended up looking for another job and a job as a skills tutor at Cardiff University um they had that came up but it was working with the nurses physios OTs radiographers radiotherapy so it was a much more rounded role kind of doing lots of little different things with them including sort of basic life support that sort of thing um and then I thought they had an opportunity to come up as a lecturer and I went for that and was that the nursing one? Was that was the nursing yeah. one that came up? Yeah, so um the nursing lecture post came up and we I, I gave it a go because previously they'd had jobs advertised, but they were look they were looking for people who are registered NMC registered nurses. And this was the first time they put in the advert that they were looking for either somebody who was registered with the NMC, sort of the regulator here in the UK, or um, um, or somebody who was HCPC registered. So the equivalent to APRA, yeah, if I remember correctly. So it, it, again, it was that that chance of having an opportunity, and and I got the post, and it's and it's been really interesting. So this this week I've been teaching um, cardiovascular assessment, so listening to hearts, chests as well as sort of lower limb vascular assessments and things like that as well. So it's it, it's kind of sort of expanded my scope a lot. But again, it's that, that gives you that appreciation to think about more than just the legs. Yeah. So how many years have you been doing that for now? Uh, I started, I've been doing that for about a year. So I um, started June last year. Okay. The so, one day a week you're working in your own practice. Yes. Did you start, when did you start that? So I started that, that was, when did I start that? That was probably about three or four years ago. And okay. that, and that, that kind of, that was sort of, I was doing sort of the, the clinical uh, work at the university and that sort of together. 
And then so at the moment I do sort of condensed hours. So I do a full time contract with the uni, um, but then I get a one day off to do some clinical work. Do some other stuff. Yeah. And it is quite nice. It's, 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 a, it's it helps, like I say, it's, I find it quite therapeutic seeing my patients on a Thursday. And uh, they, they kind of help me sort of just get, get a bit of perspective after a week of lots of teaching and running around. So, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really fun job. It's a really good team. And it's, it's definitely a different way of thinking as a nurse compared to being a podiatrist. I've yeah, found... and, and how do the how do the nursing students uh well let's say the other people that are lecturing in the nursing department they all know you're a podiatrist not a nurse mm-hmm. but here you are teaching uh stuff that's out a, a lot yeah a long way away from the foot so so um so a lot last year i did um i did some postgrad courses so on clinical patient assessment so that kind of covered uh, okay. cardiovascular assessment respiratory assessment abdominal assessment and a full neuro assessment so that's doing cranial nerves and everything um but because obviously the students they were like so you're a podiatrist I go, yeah, yeah yeah i'm a podiatrist <laughs> so so what are you doing here so you're a nurse as well i was like no no no, i'm just a podiatrist they're like oh oh and they, they kind of get on with it and they're quite happy and they kind of get just sort of like all right fair enough they're you you seem to know what you're talking about. You seem to know what you're talking about. Let's let's uh let, let's listen to what you got to say. And they kind of they they they're, they're quite receptive. Um, the do you, do you mark the, their exams? Yes. Okay. Well, that's all you got to tell them. Just go. It doesn't matter what you think of me, whether I'm podiatrist or not. I'm marking <laughs> your exams. Show me some respect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, 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 there's never any disrespect. There's always yeah. there's lots of respect. So, uh, and. And uh, the staff at the uni have been been really really good. Have been fantastic. It tends to be from when I see my patients on on a Thursday, they're like, "Oh, so so you're only doing this one day a week?" I go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm teaching." And they're like, "So are you a nurse as well?" I was like, "No, no, no, no." I'm like, they're like, "Oh." So either they're really impressed or they think I'm really strange. So you can be both. They might think you're you. Can be, yeah, you're both. <laughs> you're really good Probably. and strange. <laughs> So yeah, so it, it it kind of works quite nicely because um, I get to see a lot more, a lot a lot more different things than what we would teach. Um, um, but then I tend to do, still do a lot of anatomy and physiology. That's still all the same, and we still yeah. do full body anatomy and physiology. Um, we still do sort of um, diabetic management. Wound care is still wound care. So again, there's lots of transferable stuff there that we as podiatrists kind of need to think sometimes we're podiatrists we doesn't necessarily mean that we just have to live in our our own little silo of podiatry world we need to be thinking more about reaching out okay so going back to the original topic of routine podiatry yes what other names would you give it if it wasn't if you weren't going to use the word routine how else do you think podiatrists could say it to give it more meaning um so I, I i've been trying with that myself so i've been thinking about it could we should we just call it foot care just foot care we don't need to state whether it's general or routine it's just foot care like we'd say wound care we don't say actually say it's routine wound care yeah or basic foot care for basic uh wound care it's just wound, it's care. Just wound care okay or do we kind of take a leaf out of the nurse's book and where they sort of saying uh, uh, fundamentals of care, do we need to sort of make it the fundamentals of foot care? Okay. So again, it, it highlights that it's essential, but it's the basic. It's sort of the the more, not, it's the first point of court. Essential foot care. There you go. We call it essential, essential foot care. Yeah. So again, it's, that, it's kind of thinking about how, how we frame things because then if we're saying routine or basic foot care and other healthcare professionals pick up on that they're not yeah. going to necessarily know the importance of what we're doing okay yeah make it, i can and i can explain it from a, a patient's point of view too uh do you need a routine foot care appointment or do you need an essential foot care appointment essential and routine uh two completely different meanings to it yeah or it could even be um, like we take a leaf out of the dentist book and we go for a checkup. 
Okay. So, so what about so when you're when you have a patient with you and regardless of what the come whether it's toenail problem, horns, callus, do you have a, a certain regime of things that you check on each consultation? Yeah, so um I do monofilaments, uh do Dopplers, uh check pulses. Um, and then if anything else comes up, it tends to be from your history. So when you're making that, taking that history, how they've been, what's going on with them. Um, and if there's anything else, then you kind yeah. of pick it up from what, where the student, where the, the student, where the patient wants to go with it. <laughs> you can tell my, my brain's adult. No, no. So, so how often, like with the, the filament and filament tests, do you do this once a year with them or... Are there certain things that every time they come in, you're you're always just checking? Do you have do you do them like all in one visit once per year, or do you do a different test? Yeah, you know, like every couple of months that they come in just to keep it interesting. Um, I do um the test every time they come in. So okay. I'll, so I'll do pulses. I'll do a a sort of a slim down monofilament. First time I'll do sort of all ten sites generally then kind of do a slim, slim down version or if the patient's noticing any sort of symptoms or anything. Um, but yeah, no, th those sorts of things I do routine uh, regularly. See, I got to keep catching myself regularly <laughs> at every appointment. And again, patients are like, Oh, I didn't realize I had a pulse in my foot. I know that surprises like, them, doesn't it? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I, 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 I tend to go, I hope you've got a pulse in your foot. Otherwise we're in trouble. So again, it's kind of then highlighting the importance of sort of blood flow and things like that. And again, it's that it's that it's making sure you're doing those assessments, but then also making sure just as much as you do your assessments and you do your tests is that your history is uh, complete and accurate. And that's yeah. the most important. You, what is it? The, there's the stat is most um, diagnoses are, are based around eighty to ninety percent history, ten percent actual tests. Okay. But I know so when it, I, it, yeah. So yeah, it's just a case of making sure that history is complete and you've got that fully rounded history from your patient. Yeah, I've had, um, I know when you'd be with patients and you might be checking, say, pulses, and then the next thing you might be, yeah, skin colour, uh, yeah, where there's hair present on the toes, like all these different tests, papillary tests, all this different stuff. And you can see your patients going, and then you're explaining it to them while they're doing it, and they've gone, "Wow, I didn't know that." Well, isn't that interesting? And yeah. and some of some of the people you mentioned some, but yeah, having hair in your toes, and some patients because they're eyes, they go, "I haven't got any hair in my toes." So you pull it just to prove to them there is, and it hurts every single time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that mean to my my patients. I don't pull their hair toe, toe hair. <laughs> uh, I used to love it when I would strap somebody's foot up. I'd be strapping their foot up a certain way, especially if it was a guy who had a really hairy foot. And I'd always make sure I put a bit of extra tape on the top. <laughs> and they go, that's going to hurt when I take it off. I said, no, no, just leave it there till you come back. I'll take it off for you. And uh, so they go, oh, just just rip it off quickly. I go, yeah, no problem. And I'd, I'd do it so slow, it was almost like hearing a guitar string picking. <laughs> As it went through, and they go, "Oh, you're a mongrel." And I go, "I oh, know, but it's funny." So I do the same thing if I was, you know, bandage on the toe or something. I'd make sure I put the, the tape on top of the hairs on the toe, just just for my own entertainment. The things we the things we do to keep ourselves amused. Yes. Yeah. No. It, it, it's. Yeah. No. I think I think that's really important. It, it's a case of making sure that 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 history and and how you work that in with the patient and like you say the patients are going oh you're doing all of this and you kind of explain why you're doing it and then yeah. they kind of it helps bring them on board with them sort of taking on board any advice because they're going to still think oh this guy knows what he's talking about or this podiatrist knows what they're talking about so it's a case of making sure that they're they're involved in that in that sort of consultation process as well yeah, and um, we'd go as far as if someone had, you know, corns or calluses building up a certain area and you'd be doing just simple muscle testing. Yeah, you know, plantar yeah, flexion, exactly. dorsal flexion, inversion, eversion, and you explain to them why you're doing it and what muscles are involved and if one side's weaker or another. And even just taking it from that initial test that you did or what they came in with and just taking that a little bit further and then maybe 
doing a couple of flexibility tests with them as well, it really it broadens their mind. Oh, wow. I thought I came in just to get that corn taken off, which is what the other podiatrist used to do at the other clinic. But you're yeah. doing that and at the same time educating me. Yeah. And, and and that's what every everything we do should be all about sort of health promotion. That should be sort of intertwined um, in what we do anyway. So kind of making sure the patient is aware of their their foot health or and their general health and what they can do to help themselves just as much as and just as much as um we how you can help them so like you say with that patient who's got corn you're going to be doing those muscle tests and you're going to see if you can find any weakness you're going to have them have a quick walk up and down and see how, how they're how they're moving and then you might sort of say look at this stage we'll try try this x y and z or we can think about orthotics and things like that to take the pressure off but you might but that's up to you or you can just keep coming and see me yeah and you kind of kind of build that rapport with them saying okay this person isn't just about getting me back in every eight weeks six to eight weeks this person wants to kind of get me to a point where i can probably might be able to manage this myself yeah and i used to yeah that's how i would train the people that work for me i would say every person that comes in other than just someone who's elderly who can't cut the toenails or or a high-risk patient can't cut the toenails but i say everything else I said, normally there's a biomechanical underlying problem there. Okay, so mm -hmm. make sure you're slowly educating the patients every time they come in. We had pressure platforms and and video cameras, and we would slowly just do these different tests with them each time they come in and just explain a little bit more. And we'd had a, like a, a bit of a general rule, not that it's 100% accurate, but we'd sort of say to the patient, anything on top of your feet, footwear related. Anything on the bottom of your feet, it's usually got to do with the way you walk. Just as a, as a general rule. And yeah. then you'd say to the patient, hey, stand on this pressure platform. They step on it and they go, oh, what are those big red areas? Okay. They're exactly the same spots where you have a thick callus or corns building. They go, oh, isn't that interesting? Why is that there? And then it would just spark a conversation. And it made it more interesting for me and long-term made it better for them. And if they didn't want to do anything about it, then fine. Just keep coming in every six or eight weeks. And, and that's it. And, and that's it. It's, it's been, and that's kind of taking that to that next level of being. I know it's, we need to be uh, us as practitioners need to be patient centred, but yeah. within that, you need to patient to help lead their own healthcare journey as well. So, so you might hold their hand and lead them through to start off with, but then there will be come a point where they will start walking on their own, saying, "Okay, well, let's do this, this, and this that we've discussed on." ages ago i think we should try to give, give that give that a go and, and kind of helps them sort of build that bit bit more of a picture on, on how you you develop that rapport and how you can get that that patient into your clinic and get them better and it's just not just about like you say what we would term as cut and come again yeah yeah we said the same thing here <laughs> so yeah so it's that it's those sorts of things that we we should all be trying to move away from that sort of cut and come again sort of philosophy. Yeah, bre bread and butter. They used to call it bread and butter yeah, work. But I think one. all these yeah. terms, all this terminology was taught to us at university. This is what our lecturers yeah. told us because we would have clinic days where the first years would just be doing routine foot care and it was your cut and come again, your bre bread and butter podiatry. So it was treated like it was insignificant and didn't mean anything. Yeah, but, and I would say your biomechanics was the sexy, and yeah, biomechanics and orthotics was the sexy part of podiatry. And the longer I do podiatry, the more I feel that everything is equal, and yeah. it's the patient that's important, and every patient should be treated exactly the same way. Yeah, no, exactly, and and, and it's that, and I completely agree because it, it, it's it's I've been guilty of sort of bread and butter podiatry, cut and come again. <laughs> I, I I I'll hold my hands up. I, I'm I'm yeah I'm, yeah me too. I'm, I'm guilty of that, but it's it's that thing about just as much as your 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 foot care type patient comes in and they're they're kind of you kind of trying to discuss a bit of MSK or uh, diabetic health promotion with them. That MSK patient might come in and say, "Oh, I've got a problem with a heel, or I've got a problem with my Achilles." But they've got a raging ingrown toenail, and you're kind of like, right, let's deal with that first because that's yeah. more important. And then what you've actually come in for, and then we can go back to that. 
So it's it's those sorts of you can bring those those MSK type patients, those musculoskeletal patients, into sort of what are, are sort of the, where they need to be educated about their foot care as well. So it goes both ways. It's not just just the the one way of, of sort of discussing with patients. So it's a case of, again, it goes both ways. Yeah, and, and that's why I think it's important for us to always be educating our patients on everything that we do, because and I've told the story on the podcast numerous times where I had a young girl come to the clinic, she was 16, but I'd known her since she was two, known the family, the brother was a patient as well, the, the mother and father. I'd made orthotics for him for many years. And she came in one day to get a new pair of orthotics made. She had a big bandage on her toe. And I said, uh, so what's going on there? Oh, I had an ingrown toenail and went to the doctor and he did surgery on it. It's really bad. And I went, well, why? Why would you go to a GP and get the surgery and not come here? Well, why would I come here? You don't do that. You just do orthotics. And I'm like, wow. And that was a real big eye opener. And that, and to tell you how close I was with this family, you know, I went to a wedding a couple of years ago. So <laughs> still, yeah, like I was very close to this family and they didn't know that even routine general foot, essential foot care was even something that we did in our clinic. They thought all we did yeah. was orthotics and all we did was biomechanics. That's it. Yeah, and 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 that's 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 thing is making sure that that as podiatrists we're 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 a broad t- church. There's lots of us. We, we yeah. deal with a, a wide range of things, and everybody's welcome. Uh, and if 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 I can't help you, I certainly know somebody who'll be able to help you and refer you on to them. I and definitely that, and that's agree. That's the way we should work. So, Britton, before we wrap up, have you got any final words of wisdom to share with anyone listening to this? Um, I would probably say is that um, think about your patient. Don't just focus on their feet. Think about what else is going on. Yeah. Think about um, how well your history is and think about um, what extra can you do for that patient? It doesn't cost anything. What extra can you do? Even if it's a nice bit of advice. No, that is, that is a fantastic point. And I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast and actually talking about this particular subject that routine, there's nothing routine about routine foot care. I think it was a, a great topic. And like I said, I think this episode is going to do really, really well. So thank you very much. No, no, that's it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tyson. <laughs>